الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين الصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد مبارك وسلم صل عليه ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أما بعد الحمد لله we cannot show enough gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has allowed us to experience another blessed Jum'ah in which the rewards are abundant and the mercies are prevalent. For today's Jum'ah, insha'Allah, I would like to speak about something that we neglect and it is something we do not even realize in that we are neglecting. And this is our understanding of the Qur'an and primarily Surah Fatiha. So if someone was to just read that Fars and that with them, they will read Surah Fatiha minimum 20 times a day. So we are reading these seven, eight lines 20 times a day for our life. So you could talk 20 years, 20 times a day. Do they know the translation of it? Do they know what he is saying? After 20 years and 20 times a day saying it, does this person know the translation of what he is saying? And a lot of the problems now are that we don't. We don't even know basic tajweed. We don't know even how to read it. Never mind to understand the Quran. Surah Fatiha, Alhamdulillah, subhanahu wa ta'ala put it at the beginning. And Fatiha by translation means opener. And they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed this first because this sets the precedence for the rest of the book. So if anyone has any questions about our either has any questions, what does Islam believe in? This Surah Fatiha will put it all there clear for you. Whereas if you go into the Bible, you can't find clear verses about their Tawheed, about their beliefs. If you go into the Torah, they don't have clear beliefs. Even now I just had a, uh, a class and we had a Jewish rabbi teacher. And she shocked me what she told me. She told me that the current Jewish belief now is that there is no hell or heaven. That after this life, there is only reincarnation. SubhanAllah. And I can see when Allah speaks about these people in the Quran, the Dalin, the gone, people who have gone astray. How have they gone from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to those of the Hindus? How have they gone to that extent? And this is what happens when you lose your way. And this is what happens when you abandon the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So khair, before we look into Surah Fatiha specifically, one might think, okay, I just realized I'll be reading the Quran, but I don't even know what I'm reading. Do I still get reward? What's the point of reading then? And I give you a story of a, a child. And this child came to his father and he was complaining. And he goes, Dad, every day after Fajr, for hours on end, you make me read this book, you make me read the Quran. But I don't understand it, I'm not learning anything. I'm not benefiting every day. Why do you make me do this? Now, what would I say would be, you'd, you'd shout at him or you'd tell him off and say, what kind of stuff are you saying? This is blast. It's the wrong way. When a child asks, the best way is to make them understand the right and the wrong. So again, he had a wise father, so his father thought of an extra way to teach him. Why we read the Quran, even if you don't understand it? So he gave him a basket. You've seen a laundry basket, he has holes in it. He gave him a laundry basket. And he says to his son, I want you to go to that river. It's about a mile away. I want you to go to that river. I want you to bring this basket full of water back. Again, it's got holes in it. It's not going to fill. The son goes, okay. He goes to the river. He puts water in it, pulled back. But by the time he's come back, the water's already flown out. His father goes, go back and bring me more. All right, fair enough. Turns back, pulls back, same. And dad, the water's fell out again. He goes, go back, go bring me more. Now the son's getting annoyed. Now, twice I've done it, third time, it's not going to change. The water is still going to fall out. His father goes, no, go do it. So he's done it, and angrily he's come back and said, look here, the water is still up now. Father goes, go back. Now the son had enough. Now he's like, no, dad, I'm not going. The water is falling out. I'm not bringing you what you want. And then the father calms down. So now we realize he learns a lesson. The father goes, son, 
the basket I gave you was black and dirty. What? Look at the basket that you are holding now. And the story said that the basket was gleaming and white. And he goes, this is the effect the Quran has on your heart. Even if you don't understand the word in it, still the Quran is that blessed and it will clean your heart from the inside. What about the one that does understand the Quran? That Quran won't just leave your heart easily then. That will stay in your heart. And again, this is what we are talking about. The seed is important. And inshallah, we look at Surah Fatiha then. <clears throat> at the start of every surah in the Quran, we start with Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Now the Arabic word for this is the Basmala. The Basmala is actually part of the Quran. So if you hear in Taraweeh, when the Imam switch surahs, they say Bismillah. Because it's part of the Quran. Only one place in the Quran where it doesn't come, and that is Surah Tawbah. Just some information for you. Now, Imam Qurtubi radiallahu ta'ala an narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Makuman, that whenever somebody has pain anywhere on the body, he should place his hand over that part and say Bismillah three times. And there's other stories like that, that they would heal people with Surah Fatiha, with Surah Yaseen, etc. And then when we tell stories to these people, they will come back to the ulama. That, Alama sahab, last week you said that if I read this and put Bismillah in my hand, I should be cured, but I'm worse pain than I was last week. And then we explain to them, because look who was reading it, how they were reading it. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was reading the Quran, it's as if he was speaking to Allah himself. When the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu ajma'in would read the Quran, they would read it with blood, sweat and tears. They would feel it inside of them. That's why when they would read, they would have power. Just as in our time, you all know about them. That if there's some pious man, you say, can you do them for us? And these people are coming far and fewer. Because these are pious men. And as we know, the hadith that speak about the end times, that the pious men will, blow, will go. They will pass away. And these are the times that we are coming in. So if we want to feel the effect of the Quran, we need to understand it. We need to actually feel what we are reading. When we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praise be to Allah, then think about what are you praising Him for. Think about your children that you have. Ya Allah, you gave me children, let me praise you for that. Ya Allah, look at the food I have, look at the world you've created. We have to be active. Prayers. We are absent minded. But khair, we'll come to that later. So in the first verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Now let's analyze each word. Each word. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alhamd, what this means is all praise ultimately goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now one might think that, okay, doesn't this mean I can't praise a person? Because you just said all praise is for Allah. If I praise somebody else, is that not shirk? And this is the mindset of some people. But this is wrong. This is not the case. The point of Allah saying this is to remind you that whatever good you see in this life, whatever khair, whatever praise you might want to give, know that ultimately it comes back to Allah. You might look at a man and say, MashaAllah, you've got a beautiful voice. But who are we ultimately praising? The one who created the vocal cord for him. When we say to someone that, MashaAllah, you've got a beautiful face. Who are we praising? The one who fashioned that face for him. That's what we mean when we say Alhamdulillah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His own blessed name appears. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Why did Allah use Allah here? Why not use al Hay, al Qayyum, any of the other names? And Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, he says that Allah is the personal name of Allah. Ismul A'zam, the greatest name. And this, a misconception of this is people seem to think that God in English is Allah. This is further from the truth than it can be. Allah in English means the only being worthy of worship. That is what Allah means. And then in English, again, we would have different meaning. So this is what Allah means. <clears throat> now we look even with the Alhamd. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place that first? Why not talk about salah first? Why not zakat? Why not being good to one another? Alhamd. Because it reminds you and it builds inside of you a habit that no matter what you do, Allah's name will appear. No matter what you do, Allah's remembrance will come in your heart. For example, look at all the du'as that we read. When you sneeze, what do you say? Shukr alhamdulillah. When you wake up, alhamdulillah hilladhi ahyana ba'da ma matana wa alayhi nashur. When you come out of the bathroom, alhamdulillah hilladhi azhab anil adha wa afa. Every time we're doing something, we're thanking Allah for this. And this is what they're saying. Keep saying bismillah, keep saying alhamdulillah. That it becomes a habit that I can't even put my hand in my pocket without just saying bismillah without control. It becomes a reflex. This is what we need to get to. This is the level we need to come to. 
Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word for himself, Rabb. And it's key this. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use Rabb? And the ulama, Imam Razi rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, he highlights this. And he says that one thing to know is that whenever the anbiya would do dua in hardship, they would always use the word Rabb. They might say, Allahumma, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. But whenever they were in hardship, what word would they use? Rabb. Rabbi. And then they would ask for dua. <coughs> Now, we learn the word Rabb as Lord, as you read the main common English translation, the Lord of all the universes. What Rabb ultimately means, if you really delve into his grammar, Imam Razi Rahmatullah Ta'ala alayhi says that Rabb means, comes from the word Murabbi, meaning to bring someone to perfection. And who is the one bringing to perfection? That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who is he bringing? Uz. So Rob means the, the nurturer, the one who's going to make you better. Who is he making better? Who is he improving? Alameen. Now, we've translated Alameen as words, haven't we, most of the time. And that's how we remember it. And it is a correct translation. But if you want more detail, how the ulama see it, they don't see it as nations or worlds. They see it as flags. And it's a beautiful way to say it. Say, Alameen here means flags. Because what does the flag represent? Like when they went to the moon, what did they do? They put a flag down to say, this is our territory. Whenever there is a flag, this is ours. This is our nation, our place. What Allah is showing in the first verse, all these lands that you claim, all this dunya, whatever arrogance and pride you have, all of it is mine. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. I am the Lord. I am the creator of all of these things that you want. So this is the meaning of the first verse. So Allah starts with his praise. Starts with his power, starts with his awe to show you this is who I'm speaking. Then he tells you about his awe with Rabbul Alameen. Then he goes to Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Question arises why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use these two? He's got so many names. Why mention his mercy and his gratitude? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show you what his essence is. That is mercy. You were created so Allah could forgive you. I narrate the hadith regularly, Lawla Muzni Bula Zahab Allah become. If you did not think Allah would remove you, well, the that the qawm will come who will sin. Then they will ask Allah for forgiveness, then Allah will forgive them. Allah knows you're going to sin, which is why Allah has given you this advice. I know you're going to go wrong. I am the most forgiving, I am the most merciful. This is what Allah is saying. Now, from these two verses, one might become a bit relaxed. You know, this Allah is very nice. I'm not after the man is as strict as it, as it sounds, Allah has been told. But then, no, Allah is going to show you in the third verse. Maliki yawmiddin. Now the Mufassirin say that Allah said this to show you. Don't get comfortable with the first two verses. Allah is still all powerful. Just as Allah is all merciful, He's also the most just. He's also the exacted of justice. He's also the person who deals with transgressions. This is who Allah is. So you have to have a balance. And again, you can learn from this as parents. That as a parent, when you deal with a child, you should have both balance. Your child should love you. And they should have fear. But this fear should not be of physical harm. It should not be. It should be fear of your displeasure. What? My dad's going to be upset with me. This is how we made it. Allah loves us. But we're only scared of Allah because he's going to punish us. Really, we should be scared and upset because I've hurt Allah. Allah gave me everything and I just throw it back. That's why we should be upset. That's why we should be scared. And that's why when we do dua asking for forgiveness, keep that in your mind. Keep all the wrong things that we've done. And then do dua. And then, inshallah, you will feel it a bit more. But time has come to an end, inshallah. From next week, we will carry on from verse 4, inshallah. The point of telling you the tafsir of this surah is because we're going to read it every day. We're going to read it now as well. So when we read it, be active. Do not be absent-minded. Leave all of that behind. Even the ulama say that, you know, even the act of when we do this, when we raise our hands back, you are ultimately throwing the dunya behind you. That's the symbolism. You're throwing the dunya behind you. Now I am in Allah's court. So now you might listen to me or whoever the imam is reading Surah Fatiha. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. When I say Alhamdulillah, you should think about all the things that you can praise Allah. You should think of the wonders of the world. When you think of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, think about the time you've gone wrong. You've asked Allah for forgiveness and your life's gone back to normal. When you say Maliki Yawmidi, think of this world and its glamour. And think about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created and how he has created us. 
Just before we perform our sunnahs, inshallah, there will be a collection for the masjid. As you are all aware, alhamdulillah, the youth center is coming close to being finished. But there is still a way to go. And as I mentioned, this is an investment for us, especially in this community. That these youth, these children, the events, the marriages, the funerals, the happiness, the sadnesses, they will all be shared together as a community in this hall. So again, we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you abundantly when you contribute generously. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it and reward, reward you till the Yawm al-Qiyamah. Wa ma'alayna illa al-Balaagul Mubeen. Perform your sunnah, inshaAllah, the jamaat will take place after that.